renewable use and protection of water, that was and marine resources, uh, transition to circular economy, waste prevention and recycling, Pollu that's the fourth, the fifth, pollution prevention and control, and sixth, protection of healthy ecosystems. So it's a quite wide range, and this is where we are right now on the first and second one, adaptation, mitigation and adaptation, and then uh, it will be a massive, uh, a massive piece of work and this is also something which is quite new and the best thing as I see it as uh, my name is Marie Bangers, I'm head of sustainability for ACB and I'm also a member of the TIG so I represent a bank uh, and the best thing I see with the taxonomy and with where all of this is going is that there is no more need to compare apples and pears with this piece of information we can compare apples and apples and pears with pears so, and with better disclosures, we will have increased transparency in the market. So, we can make better choices, and with the choices, we can help shaping the future in the wanted direction where we want. Because regardless of what we think of climate change, whether we see it as a threat or an opportunity, or a risk or an opportunity, it is there, and we have to relate to it somehow. And it's happening and it's taking place regardless of whether we like it or not. So what is provided right now, and with what the technical expert group is trying to do, is to provide more tools, <coughs> guidances, which would be a help and support for us on how to navigate. Uh, and the good thing, and, and with uh, what I like with Andreas is how he, he uh, uh, it's very encouraging to hear, because this is regarding London or Riga or Stockholm or wherever we are, this is a bit of a green field for everyone. So this is new for everyone. No one has the full picture. No one knows more than what is publicly available uh, and what is done released in the draft forms of the take or on the taxonomy, for example. So navigating right now and how to, for the boards, for the CEOs, for the C-suites, uh, and corporate strategies and portfolio strategies, investment strategies <coughs> even, even, how to navigate in this. That, I mean, it's, it's up for everyone to be a winner in where you want to be. Uh, because no one knows more than anyone else. <coughs> All of us are sitting uh, during evenings trying to read, trying to catch up, trying to understand uh, and, and see how to apply it practically. Because that's still, it's not that easy and it's still a challenge. Uh, and as I think it, it has been quite clear, things are in the making as we speak. So uh, it's still first following what is in the making and then trying to do the uh, And uh, just before I jump into, well, I cannot, the role of disclosure, uh, what is, will becoming more available with disclosures and with taxonomy as comparability, is that if I look at, I mean, our bank and for banks and financial parties, what will, how we will apply it, it's mainly, if we look at our credit portfolio, we need to be to report and disclose how we classify our credit portfolio and the am amount of carbon-related assets we have in our credit portfolio. Yeah? And with that transparency, that will influence investment decisions in us. So our stock and share price will be dependent on who, how we provide credits to and what parties. And the more, I can tell you straight away, that the more taxonomy compliant parties, the better terms and conditions, because everyone would like to have them in their credit portfolio. And the same for the fund side. If we right now have about 120 funds, uh, out of them, we have approximately 20% uh, are of asset under management. We have with our own with sustainability criteria, and we would like to go to 100%. But we also would like to apply the taxonomy criteria so it's not just our criteria, sustainability criteria, or we ESG criteria, as Andreas mentioned. It would be something we feel comparable to other banks, and that would also uh, affect our evaluation and uh, how investors would, uh, would see us. Uh, and same for pension funds. I mean, if, if they would offer in a strategy that for my pension funds, uh, my customers, I would have 5% taxonomy compliant to 20, and then plus something, well, middle green or light green. Uh, that means that you are kind of future proof uh, or future proven. Uh, and therefore the risks are lower 
and that should lead to higher evaluation. So there is a lot of material and the bottom line in all this is the disclosure. Mm? Because disclosures uh, will uh, increase, that will uh, provide transparency to taxonomy, that will be the fundament for being included in the benchmark, and that would also be essential for green bonds on how to disclose. Yes, uh, I will try to be uh, fairly short and just make a few dives into this uh, because I understand what is the mandate of the technical expert group on disclosures relates to the non-financial reporting directive. I don't know how well informed you are, how many in here are reporting according to the non-financial reporting directive from 2014? No one? <laughs> how many have ever heard of it before? Okay, better. How many are uh, in a corporation where the, uh, the mother company is reporting on it? Used a few. Okay. Okay. Then perhaps I will do this a little bit differently uh, than I used to, and I will we will see what I will present more as uh, guidance and as something on how to apply uh, on rational logic and ways of thinking instead of just looking at it as a reporting directive. So this is part of what is taking place right now to kind of close the gap and to a little bit like pollute the pace principle uh, and increase transparency and then for the market to kind of resolve it with various items. So uh, GDP could be a good measure still but with disclosing some other impacts. Uh, so what is the in, so therefore, the mandate of our group was to provide recommendations to the European Commission when they are updating a non-binding guideline which is supporting document accompanying the, the law, the directive. So this is still is non-binding, uh, but it is um, it is more fruitful and it comprises more material. So if therefore it's more explanatory and it's easier to grasp. So if, um, that, uh, therefore I think it provides a little bit more of, it's an easier read than the law itself, to put it short. Uh, and our uh, mandate of it uh, was to, to provide recommendations for climate related metrics, to also integrate the TCFD, the G20 and FSB's uh, working group, uh, who provided an axe cut in how to view climate-related disclosures and climate-related risks uh, and also refer to the upcoming taxonomy. This means that the non-binding guidelines which are connected to the law uh, are related to the taxonomy. So uh, it's, it's everything is coming from various angles and into one new playing field with different pieces of the puzzles as we heard here starting out uh, in the beginning. Uh, so that will be the recommendation and this will, then it's uh, for the Commission to publish the non-binding, the new updated non-binding guidelines. Uh, our take report was published in January uh, and uh, then it was a number consultation and the Commission has published in February, I believe it was, uh, a kind of consultation document uh, which has also been a public consultation and then for June is for the, the final one. And if we have a look at some uh, I, I intended to do a few dives, but I will uh, jump into one as uh, we didn't have that many reporters in here. Uh, if we just look at one way of thinking, and this could be applicable for all corporations, investors, funds, equity managers, regardless of whatever uh, entity you are representing. The concept of materiality. Before, money was mainly just seen as money. But right now, the shift in mindset, as I interpret it, uh, is that we are starting to go from that into looking at the impact of money. What is the money basically doing? Uh, and with that, uh, we have the law, and this is a quote, it says that the company is required to disclose information on these four areas where climate goes into environment, uh, to the extent necessary that such information well, is necessary for an understanding of the company's 
development, performance, position and impact of its activities. This means that regardless of how your products and services, what impact, uh, how, you, you need to look at materiality from two, two dimensions. It's mainly, one dimension is how climate change would impact your company. And then the other way around, how your company, how the products and services you place on the market or the advisory you're doing or the forestry <coughs> business, how that is positively or negatively impacting climate. And both of these are to be reported. And both of these are uh, the CEO's responsibility and its board's responsibility uh, in corporate governance. And the new thing, which it has been clarified in the new uh, draft non-binding guidelines, is that the one dimension, the how climate change is impacting your company, that is a financial perspective. That is a financial materiality. Because it could be either, you could, if you happen to have a lot of activities which would be classified as green according to the upcoming taxonomy, you could then qualify to be in the index, you would attract more capital you would, uh, to a better terms and conditions, you will, uh, you will be part in this transition, mainly. Uh, and that's the financial aspect. But it could also be the other way around, that you, what you put in the market, it could have a high impact on climate change or a low impact. It could mitigate or it could adapt. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that is more of interest to wider society, to NGOs, I mean to us as citizens, even though we are not an investor in that particular company. We want to know, can we manage the Paris Agreement? Can we, how can we manage the well below two degrees scenario? Or how will we, in the long run, uh, what will it look like? And that's the other dimension. So both of these dimensions. And this is a bit of a change uh, of uh, ways of working. Uh, so what, what's, uh, which can easily be brought or easily, well, it, it can be brought, uh, the rationale can be brought to any kind of entity. Uh, because um, in, the, in the directive itself, it has these five elements, A, B, C, D, E, uh, where everyone under this uh, directive should report and disclose on the business model and how the business model would work uh, in a low carbon society or low carbon environment. How you relate to these two aspects. Is it supportive or is it not? And how would you then change or adjust your strategy related to the trajectory and the Paris Agreement and related to, I mean, we need to, it's not a, it, it's like if we previously had, had a lot of freedom, which we still have to some degree, uh, then practicing for a run, you could go for a three kilometers run or a five kilometers run or a marathon. The Paris uh, Agreement is basically an ultra marathon. This means there will be some effort needed uh, and transparency will be required on the effort. So this is what I meant with the greenfield, how to navigate in this. That's on the board and that's on the strategy level, that's on the corporate governance side. How you would like to manage your assets and how you would like to to make this transformation. Uh, so, uh, and then, uh, and here is, uh, there are a few pictures illustrating what I tried to describe <laughs> on this. So here's the uh, impact climate, impact on a company, and company impact on climate, both of these. And if we aggregate them, we will get the same items, which will go for everyone in the room as risks and opportunities. So it could either be as laws and regulations are increasing, because this has been fairly unregulated in the market except for this directive uh, uh, targeting 500 employees. So we would have on the risk side, uh, we could face policy, legal, technology, market and reputational risks depending on how we are managing the impact uh, our clients would have uh, and that would be the financial materiality and we would also on the other hand side uh, how a company could impact climate change. Uh, that could also be uh, positives and negatives or carrots on this one. Um, TCFD, familiar with that? Yes. Uh, that uh, if we then had IFRS uh, as a question, the TCFD is the G20 FSB's working group and they came up with recommendations uh, and they go very well together. We did a mapping in the technical expert group. So they go very well together with this directive. 
So mainly, uh, instead of having overlaps and instead of having multiple reporting standards, they can be put on top of each other and fit quite well. That is the key message. And here is one way of mapping them, uh, ensuring that if you report according to this, you will cover both. So you don't need to, to know uh, them individually. Uh, but there could also be other ways, so this is just one example of the mapping, uh, which was done by... So is this yeah. mapping also for global reporting initiative, as it is one of the most popular mm -hmm. non-financial reporting? Uh, I think that actually GRI has probably done some mapping on that one. Uh, <coughs> but the, we have uh, uh, Esther uh, Vitorini, we have uh, one from GRI in our technical expert group on the description mm -hmm. side. Uh, and to, uh, to wrap up on this closure, uh, and this is uh, being a bit on the technical side, but where if, if we can refer back, I think, back, back to the question why, why the TCFD and not the GRI, when the TCFD has been now um, really promoted by the FSB, by the Financial Stability Board, where all the central banks, uh, the largest uh, central banks are definitely behind this. So I think if you're looking at the Incarnations of, of the different reporting tools, and the TCMD is the Task Force for Climate Related Financial Disclosures yes. that was set up under uh, the G20 recommendation uh, to the uh, FSB, the Financial Stability Board. Mm -hmm. And if we can say that the, TC, the Financial Stability Board, in my opinion, they kind of realize that if EU and if the um, low carbon economy roadmap and all the negotiations agreements that are coming. The low carbon economy roadmap has to go neutral in 2050, carbon neutral. And this means that they have across all sectors, so everyone, everyone in here across all sectors. And the first starting point of that one, the first milestone is in 2020, to minus 25% in CO2 emissions reduction, 25%. So all of us reduction 25% in one year, in next year, according to the roadmap. And that is where regulation is coming on top, yes? So uh, the roadmap is like a skiing slope, it's, it's super, uh, it's, the plop. It, it's like super um, slope, uh, uh, tough. And uh, the TCFD, what the G20 and FSB then realized, in, in my opinion, was that the financial market wasn't ready, they didn't understand. So they were, um, they were afraid of disruptions. Should, when climate change, I mean when everything would start going, there could be significant eruptions within the financial market because price models, risk models, everything was not adapted fully. So that's why, in my view, that they created the TCFD and provided the first tools and guidances to bridge the understanding of the financial market, how the implications of climate change would hit them. And this is the same, if we would, I mean, have a lot of high carbon related assets in our long term credit portfolio, how would that infect us, uh, affect us? And risk for repayment, we need to, to uh, price risks for this. Uh, and that was not clear to the market. So that is why the TCFD uh, came first, but they have the one perspective of how climate uh, change impact a company and risks and opportunities for that, while the GRI has the other perspective. And the, the law, the, uh, the non-financial reporting in the camera box. So they have different... Um, but, different but uh, could you explain how you said that it's a responsibility of the CEO uh, to say how company are impacting climate? For example, come back to my sector. Uh, we, we can, everyone in Latvia are saying that we are passing the same value as we are planting back and wooden products are better than any other one, we are a good one. It's a very simple answer. A very uh, complete answer, uh, complex answer is to use land use and land use change and forestry algorithms, which no one in real forestry could understand all these plus minuses, multipliers and dividers what are used there, and, and then calculate that. And you are saying that we should report. Yes. What forestry company should use? They simply will say we are harvesting two times less than we are planting back and then we are good ones. It will be very simple and popular answer. Or we should use very complex algorithms uh, to calculate how much it makes impact and even this to understand if you are harvesting wood from this algorithm. It means that you are making emission. 
if you are producing this uh, from this wood in Latvia something, it's a harsh wood product, you are coming, uh, taking back uh, CO in the product, but if you are exporting, it means that you are not doing anything and it's only uh, emissions, not anything. These are stupid algorithms, what I'm trying to say. What company should use to report? And you're talking about transparency and so on, but in reality, it's a, it's a mess or it's a stories. Stories or mess, it's, you should... You it, it was a quite long question. If you say that you replant and if you sell, first you need to be able to demonstrate that, right? So regardless of your reporting, calculating your, your impact or not, you need to be able to demonstrate and show how much you're reporting and how much you're selling. So, so if you claim that you have a net of plus, you need to show that, right? Okay, it's very easy to, to say how much area is harvested and how much you are replanted back. Yeah, exactly. It's very easy. But when we are coming back to algorithms from green, green gas emission calculations, and I'm quite expert in my sector in that field, I would like to say this algorithm is very, very long. It takes a lot of uh, numbers what normal forester doesn't know. And, and, and it's scientific calculation in the end of the day and it's very hard and it's all for all country not for one company or one activity yes. Yes. Um, I think, if I could just quickly help in the morning yes. we had the discussion with the Ministry of Environment was there and this was with the ladies from the Ministry of Environment were referring to that they've done this for the agriculture for the forestry and they're starting this for the transport sector and also by the regions the GHG emissions uh, for the totality you're asking how to drill this down to the company level uh, it's a question if I should report my impact, yes. but could I use my own calculations or my own stories how to show it, or there will be uh, set uh, algorithms what I should use to calculate them. Right? different, the taxonomy will be per sector and per NACE codes. Okay, it will say green or brown. Yes, uh, and for greenhouse gas calculations, there are mainly two global methods which are the best ones. Uh, the one is the uh, Greenhouse Gas Protocol, it's from 2003 or 2004, and applying that one, that's what the majority in the market is doing. So there is uh, an answer to that one. Then there is also an ISO standard, uh, which I'm less familiar with, but that's, also, that's more modern, uh, and that is uh, gaining ground. So you have two options on how to apply. Uh, but also connecting it with the IFRS, I mean, as a company or as an industry, you're doing financial reporting, so you're producing an annual report, or you're at least producing some numbers. Uh, what, what this whole direction, where it's going, is that this should be, and this is also in the EU action plan, that there are three strategic high-level uh, objectives of the action plan. And one is to uh, manage risks related to climate change on equal terms as financial risks. And this goes together with, with the disclosures. So it should be on the table of the CFO uh, and it should be viewed in accordance with, I mean, similarity to IFRS. And that's where these are slowly moving into. But I think that right now we, uh, we, are, we seem to be moving over to questions. Uh, and uh, so um, how shall we do, Andrea? Yeah, should we you know, just go through. But, but I think these are exactly the reasons why we are holding these events. Uh, this is the level of change that will be required across the industries to set up the data collection to be able to report and to what the financial institutions will be uh, required to report in their own turn on the credit, on the portfolio basis. So, so this will all add up. I think interesting aspects there for the industry associations to look into some of the other countries, the industry associations are engaging in calibrating these models uh, with, uh, with the local calculations to, to aid the companies. So, because otherwise we're in a, in a situation where, especially for the smaller and medium-sized enterprises that have not started thinking about this, they will all have to try to do this on their own, or uh, there will be a bit more of a joined up effort uh, to help exactly with, uh, with these uh, with, uh, answers to the questions that you're asking. But it's also, I mean, the more precise and the more transparent everyone can be, the better you can negotiate and the, the better you can leverage your both opportunities and risks. It's like coming home, if you are going to the grocery or the supermarket and you don't, if you know exactly what you have in your, free, in your fridge, 
then you know what to complement with and what to buy. Otherwise, you have to kind of presume that yes, I remember I bought the milk last week or I, I did this and that. But if you, so this is the more precise you can be, uh, the better, uh, the less uh, unsecurity and the better value. You but when I'm using your example, it's the same when you're going to, to buy Coca Cola, you should decide to buy Coca Cola normal, this, uh, this uh, zero, uh, zero sugar. And in the end of the day, you don't know what is better. Both are not good drinks, I believe, but, but which zero, zero, uh, zero uh, sugar zero or normal one is better, we don't know. And that's the same with this. Uh, I'm, I'm very, at the moment, we have sanction law in Latvia. We should check if our partners are okay with these sanctions. And when we are going to simple company, medium sized company who is selling to UK, they don't know what to do in the end of the day. What we should make smaller these risks, but how to do? No one is answering to that. that there is only saying we should do. That, that's the same because is that. There, yeah, but that's because there is no taxonomy for Coca Cola. Mm -hmm. Maybe you can talk through the scope one, scope two, scope three. Uh, yes, uh, and, and that was the. Mm -hmm. um, um, in, in reporting, what, is, what will be in disclosures? For comparing apples with apples and not apples with pears in this greenhouse, in the greenhouse gas protocol, the largest and most well used uh, yeah, framework for, uh, for CO2 emissions. You have scope one, you have scope two, and scope three, where scope one is your own direct emissions, scope three is as a socket, in the socket if you power supply, scope three is the value chain upstream and downstream. So scope three is the most difficult one, and that's also the most accurate. That provides, so if an entity reports on scope one, two, and three, that's easier to compare with another entity who's reporting on scope one, two, and three. Uh, and that goes also for, for countries and for, for other, uh, I mean, Sweden as example, we have been really good in reducing emissions in our scope one and two, because that's how we calculate. But if we would, and that also is, a reason why the reduction also is when some of our um, productions uh, are moved uh, abroad into China and into Pakistan and Bangladesh, or not Pakistan, sorry, but Bangladesh and, and Asia. Um, uh, that would remove, uh, reduce our emissions, but it increase our else. So if we are then, if we were about to report scope one, two, and three, we will get a more accurate image. And in these negotiations, in the Paris Agreement, if China, I mean, I can totally understand if they object, if they are having increased emissions because we are reducing our emissions, <laughs> of course they don't want to have a cap on how much they should reduce because it's our, uh, I mean, it's the emissions that we have sent to them uh, for having the production uh, on their ground and on their soil, their national. So uh, if everyone would go on the full picture, uh, then we could also have some more transparency and it would be easier to. Uh, to have a fair contribution. Yes, I don't have a question. Um, currently, green and sustainable is put as equivalent terms, but in, in practicality, it's, it's, it's completely different. Yes. So, uh, how is this taxonomy would um, split? What is green and what is sustainable in order not to mix it up, at least for marketing purposes? The, the taxonomy will start with the green, uh, and there it will go for for climate as a first instance. So uh, mitigation and adaptation, that's the first one. But it also says that they should not uh, allow that they create no harm to any of the other six, as we now reheard all of them. We all remember them, of course, me included, no, I don't. <laughs> but uh, all of the six. Uh, it's also, apart from that, or besides that, it's also uh, a labor rights clause. So it has to, the activity, uh, shall comply with uh, the ILO's uh, eight core uh, conventions, for example. Um, so that you, that's, but it's still an environmental taxonomy. Uh, and there have been discussions and there have been questions or requests for more of, um, I mean, in my opinion, it would be fantastic to have a TCFD, which is for climate and impact on one hand side. It would be really nice to have a TCFD and a taxonomy for human rights, for labor rights, and for anti-corruption. All of the four areas under the EU's non-financial reporting directive. Because now, what we are doing right now, 
we have just seen the starting point. This is just if we believe that sustainability was about communication. I mean, historically, we started more as a little bit of communication. It was PR, it was glossy papers. We made this nice report, everyone distributed feel good activities. And right now, we are starting to unlock and open the window. And we did these four areas. And in the environmental field, which is huge, it's chemicals, it's air pollution, it's waste, it's, every, it's everything. Within this one field out of four, we are just looking at climate and we hear how much, I mean, that this is, requires some effort. Uh, but with a big reward, the reward will be shared by everyone and that will be the future. And that's why Greta and all these kids are, are demonstrating and protesting uh, because they want uh, to have the same opportunities as us. So, yes, I would like to have more. Uh, but this is a yarn and this is where we are right now. So regarding the taxonomy, um, so if it is classified as good for uh, environmental climate mitigation, like good for one of the topics, but harmful for the other, how is it classified? Is it still, can it still be green? Or it's like undecisive or not? Sure, it's not. Yeah, sure. 